If we go look at 2023, I think instead what we're going to see is a story about corporate earnings starting to get weaker, right? So some of them might get negative, but other ones might just not grow or might shrink a little bit um, that year. And so that's likely to put ongoing pressure on equities, uh, not necessarily because their earnings multiple is going down anymore, but because their actual earnings are just not doing very well. Um, on the other hand, that gives assets that are not valued for earnings a chance to do better. So things like gold or Bitcoin, where they're more like liquidity plays or anti-dollar plays than earnings plays. And so I do think that you could see, for example, a bottom in Bitcoin before. Basically, a lot of those are unaffected by the increase in rates. And so what happens is quarter after quarter, uh, potentially year after year, as rates are at a higher level, some percentage of debt matures and gets rolled over. Like some corporate debt matures and gets you know refinanced at these higher rates. Uh, some people just have to move. Uh, things happen, and then you know so low low interest rate debt gets refinanced at higher rates, and that eats into incomes. It eats into things that they otherwise could spend money on. Uh, you know more of it goes to bondholders, banks, things like that, and away from the the non financial industry. And that can contribute to recessionary conditions. You know, remote work was always going to happen to some degree. And what what you know, COVID did was say, okay, we're going to take the next five years of remote work and push it into three months. Um, that that kind of trend was rapidly accelerated. And so even even as it bounces back somewhat, you know, a lot of companies have already decided that they need less office space than they used to. And so there's higher, um, uh, you know, uh, vacancy rates, for example, in New York office real estate. Um, I'm sure many other uh, uh, cities as well, uh, including you know cities throughout Europe, cities in other countries. And so over time, as as those holders of those properties have to refinance their debt at higher rates, that just puts pressure. Um, so right now, U.S. unemployment, for example, looks like it's bottoming and maybe turning up a little bit. Um, you see uh, consumer confidence, CEO confidence, measures like that are very low. Um, the one saving grace that is somewhat, I think, keeping things afloat is that if you look at this year, the dollar index was soaring, which again, to my prior point earlier in this discussion, puts a lot of pressure on the entire world. Uh, but in in the second half of the year, um, you've had like a rollover in the dollar index. It, it's kind of left off some pressure. And so that, that's that been a, a constructive environment for a lot of developing countries, um, a lot of uh, just indebted entities around the world, and it's given them a little bit of like a, a, a breath of life. Um, and combined with the China's reopening, that's kind of the one variable to keep watching to say, okay, you know, the, the, the U.S. is kind of in some ways purposely putting itself into a recession to try to regain control of inflation. But then the question is, as the market, you know, looks at their inverted yield curve and maybe stops, uh, you know, paying more for the dollar, it allows these other indebted entities around the world to potentially stabilize and start doing okay. Um, so I'm, I'm perhaps less bearish on the rest of the world than the average person is, but I still think that 2023 uh, does have a lot of risks for recession or near recession, just overall kind of weak economic growth. And so, you know, I think quarter after quarter, it gets harder. Uh, the comparisons get harder from prior quarters um, as some of the conditions, you know, basically as as conditions stay very tight. Um, so I think I think that's probably one way to look at it that, you know, these things take time. And then also the way I was phrasing it was the Fed can tighten, but they can't normalize, which is that, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, there's too much debt. The Fed can never raise rates. And it's like, well, of course they can in the short term. Right. I mean, if, if you look at, for example, U.S. debt. The average maturity is something like five years. Um, now it's it's somewhat front loaded because you have thirty year debt on one hand, and then you have you know trillions and trillions of dollars in, in T bills, which is you know that that all refinances within within say a two year period. Um, and so, you know, if they raise rates to five percent overnight, it doesn't mean that all U.S. debt is now five percent higher. It basically means that you know starting with those T bills. Some of the existing short-term debt starts getting refinanced at higher rates. There's a very big difference between, say, holding rates at 5% for five years versus doing it for one year because more and more of that debt gets refinanced at that higher rate. And so the way I would phrase it is that the Federal Reserve is unlikely to get back to a period of, of positive real rates and then maintain it for years. Um, but they can get to either positive rates in the near term – 
or they can get up to higher rates while inflation is still high. So, for example, what's remarkable is that as much as the Fed has tightened, they're still below the official inflation rate year over year. Um, and so they're still in, in negative real territory. Now, they are higher than inflation break-evens, which is you know, supposedly the market's um, estimate of forward inflation. So they're positive in that sense, but they're still below trailing year-over-year inflation. So they've tightened, um, but it's not like they've done like a Volcker 1970s thing. Yet. So I think that they might maintain levels that long. I mean, the market and even the Fed's already kind of pointing to early 2023 is when they're probably going to start topping out in terms of their rates. Um, and then the question is, how long can they hold it? And then that will largely depend on whether or not a recession materializes or not. I mean, if a recession starts to materialize, they're going to get a lot of pressure to pull back. Um, if a recession manages to be narrowly avoided, let's say China reopens hard enough and, and the weaker dollar around, you know, uh, gives enough countries around the world a boost to kind of, you know, hold up the equilibrium and we kind of narrowly avoid a recession, then you can stay tighter for longer. Um, there's also, you know, if inflation returns uh, and the Fed is still holding rates, you know, within, say, 100 basis points of where they are. Um, you can have an environment where they're actually not that tight on a real basis. Um, and so I think that the, the question becomes, what are they going to do with quantitative tightening? So you could potentially hold rates where they are, but then stop selling bonds, for example. That's, that's a way of slowing down your tightening while still trying to be somewhat tight. Um, and because they drain the Treasury General account a little bit, they've been able to keep selling bonds. But if you don't have those variables, let's say in the first half of 2023, then I think the Fed's quantitative tightening gets pretty challenging for them to maintain. So overall, I think that they're going to maintain some degree of tightness throughout 2023, but exactly how tight will partially depend on what happens with uh, recessionary conditions, while also keeping in mind that it's not as tight as you'd expect, given how high inflation is relative to some of those rates. And so, But I'm looking forward now to 2023 to see if we start to get more unemployment rate ticking up. Um, and so that's what I would look at the combination of, of PMIs, unemployment, um, and things like that, as well as, you know, the Atlanta Fed does a pretty good real-time estimator for what the quarterly GDP is going to be like. Um, so we, like, in this quarter, they've been tracking what they think is going to be by the end of the quarter, which of course isn't, isn't reported till the next quarter. Uh, all throughout next quarter, they'll be tracking it, which again, we won't find out till quarter two what you know, quarter one's GDP was. So I look at that as a somewhat real-time estimate for at least the direction of where things are headed. One thing I'll point out is that 2022 was mostly about valuation compression. So as the dollar was hardened, essentially, so higher higher rates, um, higher dollar index, that put a lot of valuation pressure on a lot of companies. So, you know, it's not that companies' earnings fell apart. It's that, you know, instead of paying 25 times earnings for a stock, people said, let me let me pay 18 times earnings. Well, then you had unprofitable growth that got absolutely crushed. And a lot of this is because, you know, if, if, if the 10-year treasury pays you 1% a year um, and you want to then go into equities instead, you say, okay, what is the target rate of return I want on equities? And you might say, I want 5% better than treasuries. So I want at least a 6% return. Um, and so you pay a pretty high multiple for those equities because you're, you're comparing it to what is essentially a very overvalued treasury. On the other hand, if the treasury is yielding 4% and you still want a 6% uh, equity risk premium, well, then you want a 10% return on your equities. And so you're going to pay a lower multiple for the same equity. And so as you've gotten higher long duration bond rates, that puts downward pressure on a lot of equity valuations, especially growth-oriented equities more so than value-oriented equities. Obviously, Bitcoin got impacted by it, even though it wasn't at the heart of that whole thing. And so that's all been negative. Generally, if you look historically at Bitcoin's price action, it does follow global liquidity very closely. And so as liquidity pulls out, you know, Bitcoin's done poorly. It's even done more poorly than I thought because some of the industries were so you know, like FTX blowing up this spectacularly was not really on most people's radar, for example. If we go look at 2023, I think instead what we're going to see is a story about corporate earnings starting to get weaker, right? So some of them might get negative, but other ones might just not grow or might shrink a little bit um, that year. And so that's likely to put ongoing pressure on equities, uh, not necessarily because their earnings multiple is going down anymore, but because their actual earnings are just not doing very well. Um, on the other hand, that gives assets that are not valued for earnings a chance to do better. So things like gold or Bitcoin, where 
they're more like liquidity plays or anti-dollar plays than earnings plays. And so I do think that you could see, for example, a bottom in Bitcoin before you see a bottom in equities. Um, I do think you could have a better year for gold than you do for stocks, for example. Uh, I think that that's, as a base case, the type of year I'd expect for 2023, unless or until I start to see evidence that, that says otherwise. On the other hand, you know, the recession uh, you know, uh, amid the 2008 crisis was, was very long. It lasted well over a year. Um, and so there are different Im impacts, both in the private sector and from the public sector, that can either shorten or, or lengthen a recession. Usually there's a, a trade-off with that, right? So if you have a recession and you print a ton of money and throw stimulus at it, uh, you can get out of that recession quicker, um, but then you've done it at the cost of higher debt and then potentially for a, a more inflationary uh, rebound in the future, which then you have to then raise rates super quickly and potentially put yourself into another recession. Um, and so there are levers you can pull, but it's like every lever has like a cost associated. Right now, it seems that I think they're going to be slow to do stimulus. Um, and so I, I think this could be a longer, more grindy type of, of environment that's maybe less deep than people think. So, so a lot of people are afraid of like a 2008 repeat. In the decade that followed, banks are – if you look at a bank balance sheet, it looks the opposite of how they looked in 2008. So they're actually overexposed historically to treasuries and, and you know cash, and they're underexposed to loans. Um, I don't view banks as being like the epicenter of it, at least in the United States. European banks are – on average, uh, not as strong in my view, um, but at least in the U.S., you don't have that kind of like a center weakness at the heart of the financial system. Instead, it's dispersed elsewhere. It's it's dispersed in kind of you know any corporation that is marginal and as its debt uh, you know servicing costs going up over time as it has to roll over its debt. And so, if you look at at for example the the recession after the 2000 bubble, never really actually reached the especially in inflation-adjusted terms, the U.S. stock market never reaches 2000 highs uh, in the next run-up, you know, going into, say, 2007. Uh, you kind of only roughly match the prior highs before then obviously crashing into the into the Great Recession. It wasn't until the 2010s decade that you, you actually fully eclipsed the, the 2000 highs in equities. Um, and the U.S., the, the recession in the U.S. after the dot-com bubble was a pretty shallow one. Um, but it was very bad for asset prices, and the bear market asset prices lasted a while. So I, I think you could get one like that potentially, where you know you have a more stagflationary type of recession. It's not a big you know bank implosion the way that 2008 was, um, but that asset prices you know instead of this like sharp V bottom and then straight up, they just kind of grind for like a while uh, sideways down. You know, maybe a year they go up, but then they don't get to their prior highs for a while. Um, I, I think a lot of sectors are probably going to be like that, where, you know, we could look back five years from now, and it's like the market's kind of gone nowhere in a in a big choppy trading range for 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 quite a while, at least for things like the S and P five hundred um, and other things that kind of went into this environment expensive.